I would like to remind you all that only a few months ago, Netanyahu said that after destroying all the tunnels in Rafah, we will reach absolute victory. It seems that reality is not always just slogans. And the story is not the Philadelphia Corridor, but the lack of the acceptance and the taking of strategic decisions. I said at the beginning of the war, children's who have not even started ninth grade will be those fighting in the Gaza and that is a reality. Anyone who thinks that we won't be able to go back to fight and that Sinwar will surrender and give us a long-term arrangement, well, then he's still in the 6th of October stuck there. I would like to say to you the real truth. Like we went into a maneuver in Gaza, and when we wanted to go and bring the hostages back and he tried to stop that and he tried to stop other things we will go back to philadelphia corridor we will go back when it's necessary we will act in hanunas in zaytun and wherever is necessary Netanyahu does not understand that everything has changed since the 7th of October, that we have to eliminate Sinwar and he isn't strong enough to, to stand against the pressure, then go home. The unfolding tragedy surrounding the detainees in Gaza has exposed the severe flaws in the Israeli government's approach to the crisis. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's refusal to reach a deal for the release of Israeli detainees, coupled with the continued bombing of tunnels in Gaza, where many of these individuals are believed to be held, has led to a devastating loss of life. This series of decisions has sparked outrage and despair, not only among the families of the detained, but across broader Israeli society, where a growing sense of betrayal has taken root. <laughs> הם קשים, לא אוכל, קצת מים, אין לנו חשמל, ירי והפצצות בלתי פוסקות. ממשלת ישראל ובראשה בנימין נתניהו, קבינט המלחמה, נכשל כשם שלי באוקטובר, נכשלתם במשימת ההגנה עלינו והאזרחים, והיום אתם מנסים להרוג אותנו, אחד אחרי השני, בניסיונות כושלים של חילוץ. והפצצות מהאוויר. איפה הייתם שירו עליי? איפה הייתם שירו עליי? איפה הייתם Former Israeli intelligence chief Amos Yadlin has been among the most vocal critics of Netanyahu's handling of the situation. Yadlin, who has served at the highest levels of Israel's security apparatus, denounced the recent security cabinet vote that backed Netanyahu's insistence on maintaining the IDF's deployment along the Philadelphia Corridor during negotiations. This insistence, according to Yadlin, effectively doomed any possibility of a ceasefire deal that could have led to the release of detainees. By prioritizing military strategy over human lives, the government has, in Yadlin's words, abandoned its moral obligation to bring home the women, children, elderly and soldiers who were taken from their homes on October 7th. The criticism from Yadlin and others points to a broader strategy by Netanyahu's government, one that appears to be more focused on maintaining power and political control than on resolving the humanitarian crisis at hand. This approach is not new. It reflects a long-standing tactic of escalating tensions and conflicts to divert attention from domestic issues, such as the protests that were sweeping across Israel in the lead-up to the October 7th events. By stoking crisis in Gaza, Netanyahu's government has managed to shift the narrative away from its failures at home, using the plight of the detainees as a pawn in a larger political game. The impact of these decisions has been catastrophic. As Israeli forces continue to bomb Gaza, they do so with full knowledge as they are targeting. This has not only led to the deaths of these detainees, but has also further entrenched the conflict, making any potential resolution increasingly difficult. The government's refusal to prioritize the lives of its citizens in Gaza has sparked a wave of protests across Israel, with thousands of Israelis taking to the streets to demand an end to Netanyahu's regime and the immediate sealing of a deal that could save those still held in Gaza. These protests have been marked by a rare show of unity 
among diverse segments of Israeli society. From public sector workers to tech firms, the nationwide strike and demonstrations have highlighted the growing disillusionment with Netanyahu's leadership. In Tel Aviv, major highways were blocked, public services were shut down, and protesters lit bonfires in the streets, all in a bid to force the government's hand. The scenes of chaos in Israel's economic heart reflect the deepening crisis of confidence in a government that appears more concerned with maintaining its grip on power than with the lives of its citizens. Commenting on the latest development in the ongoing Gaza crisis, renowned broadcaster James O'Brien has raised critical questions about the blind loyalty that many in the West have shown towards Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. O'Brien argues that this unwavering support has allowed Netanyahu to carry out actions that, under normal circumstances, would have faced widespread condemnation and accountability. He suggests that the West's consistent refusal to hold Netanyahu accountable for his policies and military actions has not only exacerbated the crisis in Gaza, but also prolonged the suffering of countless individuals, including the detainees who remain separated from their families. Everything, up to and including the fate of the hostages, then a sort of grim inevitability creeps into events. What well, Once you have accepted that, that, that the tolerance, not just the tolerance, but the promotion of criminals and terrorists in his own cabinet as a, as a proof of the prioritization of his own political survival over everything else in play, which you can sit alongside the evilness and the depravity of Hamas. You can hold two thoughts in your head at the same time, as Ben Kentish rather brilliantly explained on this radio station this weekend. Once you accept Netanyahu's approach, there is, well, to my eye, my untutored eye, there is a, a gross inevitability to what we are seeing now, um, where protesters are blocking roads in Israel to demand a deal with Hamas over the, uh, the ceasefire and, and, the, and the fate of the remaining hostages. Noga Tarnopolsky joins us now from Jerusalem. Uh, is that a fair analysis of the situation, do you think, Noga? What would you add? Hi, James. Yes, I do think so. And I think we have to add something that's difficult to discuss, but that has to be added in order to explain the eruption of mm. emotion among Israelis. And it's the just abject, cruel, grotesque manner of these six hostages' deaths, because it's not a situation like has already happened in the past year in which the cadavers of hostages were found and, you know, months after they died or were killed and, and as a result the autopsies deliver kind of murky results. Sure. It's just not the case. These are six young people and they were alive days ago. The forensic results were extremely clear that they were executed. They were days or minutes before their bodies were found. They were taken. They were shot numerous times point blank in the heads. And so you think about young people, some of them gravely wounded, who managed to survive 11 months underground mm -hmm. of torture and, and were executed shot point blank and people are talking about their last minutes of terror and that sort of thing and that has really had a huge impact the manner of their deaths you you, you would need to explain to my listeners who, who haven't been following events super closely what what, why this would see an explosion of anger against the government while the government continues to justify its actions in gaza by promising that they're doing their very best to get these hostages home so the anger to the untutored eye should be directed at the terrorists, it should be directed at Hamas, and, and Netanyahu has cast himself as the man who will destroy Hamas. So what's gone wrong with that narrative? If That's the crucial question. If you'll allow me, I want to quote a, a sentence from the American writer Franklin Foer, who I think managed to um, synthesize this. And what mm. he writes is, he writes about the American-Israeli hostage, Hirsch Goldberg, Poland, and he says his murder, the, the moral culpability for his murder rests entirely with Hamas depraved executioners. But Netanyahu behaved grotesquely when presented with opportunities to secure his release. Right. So what, what your listeners need to know is that on the night between Thursday and Friday, which turns out to be apparently 
the estimated time that these young people were taken out and executed, Netanyahu forced through his security cabinet, which is about half of his normal cabinet, a declarative decision announcing that no matter what hostage release deal is proposed to Israel, and no matter what Israel has agreed to in the past, the Israeli army will remain indefinitely on the Gaza-Egypt border. So not an Israeli border. And on the one hand, this is a meaningless, just declarative uh, kind of decision passed by cabinet. This was passed at 2 a.m., by the way, with no announcement that this would even be brought to cabinet. But on the other hand, Israelis view it as the prime minister hijacking um, messaging in order to let Hamas know at a crucial moment in the hostage release negotiations that the hostages they're holding have no value to him. So what Netanyahu may perceive as showing his base that he's a tough guy mm. and that he's tough against Hamas, it appears that a majority of Israelis perceive it as him choosing his own political survival, therefore waking at his base, instead of taking the brave and difficult decisions that a leader must take to save his own sequestered citizens. So then we come, not for the first time, to, to the question of the leverage that that portion of the population can exert upon Netanyahu. And, and the scale of the protests compounded by the strike is the strongest expression of that leverage we've seen so far. Yes, and you know, Israel really is kind of in a stranglehold. It's, it's very difficult to describe, but about half a million, an estimated half million Israelis took to the streets last night. On a Sunday night, which is a weeknight in Israel, and out of a population of just under 10 million. May, maybe you can translate that to British terms, but I did the calculation for Americans, and it's as if 15 million Americans had taken to the streets. And yet, the government, which has a very narrow but very um, unified kind of coalition majority, 64 out of 120 parliamentary seats, seems just to have seen its back stiffen. They're, they seem to be responding to this protest and their magnitude by saying, we'll show you. And so over the course of the last few hours, Israeli government ministers have just doubled down on their messages of how they're going to just kind of intensify the fighting against Hamas. And again, we have to go back to what you said. I don't think there's a single Israeli of any sort who has any doubts that Hamas is a murderous Islamist militia, you know, merciless. But that's not the point. For Israelis, the point is that they feel betrayed by their own government. And the government in response to that is basically saying, go scream on the streets, we don't care. So how does it end? I don't know. I don't know yet, and I feel like I'm kind of doubling down on my own journalistic training and I'm limiting myself sure. very closely to just telling you what is happening because this could still explode in different directions and it could end very, very badly for everybody. And so I don't want to guess or speculate. The Americans, I have to say, even though it's a holiday weekend for them, do seem to be showing some muscle maybe because this American citizen was killed and maybe because they also feel it could have been prevented, but also because their elections are coming up. And I think that the Biden administration has more or less had it with Netanyahu's, you know. So how much has Netanyahu got riding on the hope of Trump coming back in then, do you think? Or, 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 or are we beyond that kind of calculation now? O'Brien's analysis offers a sobering perspective on the broader implications of Western foreign policy in the Middle East. He highlights how the failure to address Netanyahu's actions with the necessary scrutiny and condemnation has contributed to a cycle of violence and retribution, trapping both Israelis and Palestinians in a seemingly endless conflict. By turning a blind eye to what O'Brien describes as atrocities, the international community has inadvertently enabled a status quo that perpetuates instability and suffering in the region. This analysis is particularly eye-opening 
because it challenges the dominant narrative that often frames Israel's actions as justified self-defense while minimizing or ignoring the humanitarian consequences in Gaza. O'Brien's critique serves as a call for a more balanced and accountable approach to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, one that recognizes the need for justice and reconciliation rather than blind allegiance to a government. His comments highlight the importance of holding all parties accountable to international law and human rights standards if there is ever to be a lasting resolution to the crisis in Gaza. This is why the Open Minded Thinker show thinks the use of military force as a first resort, the refusal to engage in meaningful negotiations and the ongoing blockade have all contributed to a cycle of violence that has cost countless lives on both sides. Netanyahu's refusal to reach a deal for the release of detainees is just the latest example of a policy approach that prioritizes military dominance over human rights and diplomacy. The loss of life among the detainees in Gaza is a direct consequence of these policies. The government's actions have not only failed to secure the safety of its citizens, but have also further fueled the conflict, making any future peace efforts even more challenging. The protests in Israel are a reflection of a society that is increasingly questioning the wisdom of this approach and demanding a new direction, one that prioritizes the lives of all those affected by this conflict. The Palestinian groups recently released videos of prisoners, first showing them alive and then using the footage to sharply criticize the Israeli leadership. The critique focuses on the accusation that Israel's leadership is prioritizing political gains over the lives of these detainees. These videos are laced with clear elements of propaganda, designed to pressure the Israeli government into striking a deal that would secure the release of the remaining hostages. The timing and content of these videos seem calculated to exploit public sentiment and stir up discontent within Israel, where the fate of the detainees has become a deeply emotional and divisive issue. However, the effectiveness of this pressure appears to be undercut by ongoing political maneuvering within Israel. The Israeli government faced with a complex security situation and domestic political challenges, has been cautious in its approach to negotiations, likely weighing the potential risks of any deal. This cautious approach has led to frustrations among those directly affected by the crisis, who feel that the government is not doing enough to bring their loved ones home. In response, there have been calls for strikes and protests against the government's refusal to agree to a deal. Yet even these efforts to express public dissatisfaction are being stifled. The Israeli Supreme Court has intervened, attempting to limit the democratic rights of those impacted by the crisis, specifically aiming to prevent strikes and protests that could further destabilize the situation. The court's actions reflect the broader tension within Israel, where the government faces increasing pressure from multiple fronts. On one hand, there is the humanitarian concern for the detainees, which is being amplified by the Palestinian group's propaganda campaign. On the other hand, there are the security concerns and the fear that conceding to demands could set a dangerous precedent or embolden other groups. This dilemma places the Israeli leadership in a difficult position where any decision could have far-reaching consequences both domestically and internationally.